Welcome to the Goals-Based Investing Podcast Series. Today, I'm thrilled to have my good friend, Jamie McLaughlin, as a guest as we explore the issues and opportunities with ultra high net worth families. Jamie, welcome. Tony, great to be here. Thank you. You and I have known each other for a long time, and we've had these really passionate discussions around the unique issues and opportunities around ultra high net worth families and family offices specifically. But maybe it would be worth sharing with the audience a little bit of your background and how you have such a great perspective on this space. Well, first, I should say I was late to come to wealth management. Frankly, they didn't call it wealth management at that time. I was 36 and I'd had a public career. I was a politician, uh, but I came to a broker dealer at the time, uh, Sanford Bernstein, one of the great firms at that time, was trained in what I'd say, what you are the expert in with, with GBI, sort of modern portfolio theory and asset allocation. Um, had really no background in that. I'd studied macroeconomics in graduate school and uh, through a series of runs in my career, a uh, melon, uh, then an RIA, uh, what originally Lydian, and then uh, became Convergent. We were acquired by City National, and then a family office for one of the great wealthiest uh, Americans. Uh, I was the CEO. I had a real exposure to going up market, uh, but really during the period, Tony, when wealth management came of age, wealth management got into the lexicon in the 90s. And through that experience, observed and saw and 12 years ago, I started this consulting practice around the real thesis that there's a lot more that needs to be done than just the investment management and the challenges of the uh, service menu of particularly the ultra high net worth uh, to drive uh, solutions to serve that uh, constituency is proven to be very challenging and the economics are particularly challenging. So that's what I've been doing the last 12 years, helping people in what I call theaters of operation across uh, compensation, capital structure, service models, staff configuration, the organic uh, growth challenges, inorganic growth challenges, of course, today are a big piece, and a lot of pricing work around the issue of discipline and pricing. So that's, that's what I'm doing. And, and it seems like in the industry today, there, there's so much interest in advisors moving their practice upstream. And I think it's easy to move your practice from a retail client to a high net worth client. And the high net worth client obviously has more complex needs. But I think there's a quantum leap from high net worth to ultra high net worth. And, and you've done some tremendous research in the area. Maybe, maybe just get into what are the different sort of needs of families as they get up to that $50, $100 billion threshold and all the complexities that come with that beyond the portfolio? I don't want to get bogged down in, in accounting or economic theory, but the issue of operating leverage that's based on there being fixed expenses uh, and therefore, with greater assets and, and greater fees, one can get operating leverage is just not the same. And that's mainly because of the principle that the families are requiring customized needs. And many of these needs are non-replicable. So work process and the tech enabling of work process that would largely create some economies of scale largely does not exist. But the main driver of it is that the cost of staff 65 to 80% of the expense structure is in staff, becomes much higher because you have lower capacity, capacity utilization per headcount. So you have a lot of very expensive people that carry the dialogue that are simply not getting good realization rates for their full expense because the needs are so idiosyncratic and customized. That's the driver. And so creating economies of scale can be done to some degree, but it requires much more discipline. And so discipline becomes the real issue in serving those families, discipline in pricing, client acquisition, being very careful in terms of what you will do and not do, but it's, it's still really early. At what point in time, and I, and I kind of remember my, my old sort of threshold was, you know, when I was at Morgan, we used to think um, at 250 million, it probably made sense to set up your own family office because there you would have scale and it would make sense. Um, and obviously we've got multifamily offices kind of fitting in between that. What's kind of the scaling today? And, and, mm -hmm. and are, you know, I'm not sure there are hard numbers, but are there sort of thresholds that either in asset size or complexity that kind of warrant either leveraging the multifamily office setup or developing a family office on your own? Great question. 
And I think interesting that you raised the, the threshold of $250 million. We might have said that 20 years ago, Tony. I'm, I'm of the mind now it's gotten closer to a billion, uh, but certainly 500 million and above. And in uh, a, a relatively recent study, uh, there was a, a sort of an analysis of, of families of that size. Their uh, staff fully uh, loaded cost were three to three and a half million dollars. And just a little, this is just guidance, but you're talking about a s- substantial cost and you have to look at that in terms of the commercial alternatives as a replacement cost. Could I replace that cost for that headcount by getting uh, like-kind services from a commercial provider? And you certainly can. And so what I believe we see are a number of what I call subscale family offices, meaning they really don't have uh, the economics to be efficient uh, and should go commercial. And in fact, they don't go commercial. Uh, now, there's a lot of reasons for, for that. Uh, it's generation one wealth. There may be a controlling patriarch or matriarch. But to the degree that I think there will ultimately be consideration for alternatives, they may begin to outsource to certain professional advisors, set pieces, and ultimately may see the wisdom of actually outsourcing everything. By the way, not to one firm necessarily, but to multiple firms. And so that um, doing it yourself in that 250 to $500 million zone is very expensive. And remember many of these uh, family offices still have operating businesses. So they they still have some, we will call it in the form of a dividend. They still have some uh, generation of balance sheet wealth or perhaps dividend income in terms of the ability to support the cost. But when the businesses are sold and we're into a preservation of the wealth, uh, situation, and certainly G2 or G3, it becomes extremely expensive to pay out of pocket for those services. And the commercial alternatives should begin to look more, more uh, uh, attractive. Um, but is there, again, is there a, a tendency to have certain types of staffing like an investment team, a, a tax team, a philanthropy team? What, what's a staffing look like at a family office and how then do they leverage the internal and the external expertise to kind of complete the equation? Well, we'd have to define the taxonomy of the family office, but I would start by saying that the first category would be those family offices structured to serve the needs of multiple families of a single family of wealth, uh, multiple generations. And the the large majority of family offices really are smaller bookkeeping and accounting uh, staff. Uh, They're serving uh, various reporting needs, uh, but particularly tax compliance. Uh, That's a majority of the family offices. There are a bundle of what I would call new wealth financial services, uh, hedge fund, private capital, uh, GPs that have formed family offices that are savvy, uh, have great staff, have great investment uh, 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 expectations and and staff uh, compliments. Uh, But that's a a simple minority. Uh, But they're the drivers of what I think are going to be best practices in the future. Uh, Many of them are centered here in, uh, in the greater New York area to a lesser degree for different reasons uh, in the Bay Area on the West Coast. But I think the best practices we're gonna see are gonna come from some of those, uh, what I call uh, financial services, hedge fund, private capital, uh, wealth creators. You know, it's much more than just managing the wealth. It's all these non-portfolio related issues which you raised early on. Um, I know you've done a lot of work on technology and resources and all of that. What, what are families looking for today and, and how are they managing some of these challenges? I try to divide it into three verticals uh, to just dumb it down and just keep it really simple because uh, there's so many things you could do. Um, the three verticals are the investment vertical, simply put from investment strategy to investment vehicles to the whole operational issue of supporting the investment uh, process to what I call advanced planning. And advanced planning cuts across a lot of different uh, areas where the staff really uh, that has to carry the dialogue uh, has to come from multiple relatively expensive uh, providers, some internally or embedded costs and some external. And then a third category, which is increasingly and importantly, I think going to be 
uh, a differentiator. And, that, and I don't, in the lack of a better term, I think of it as information management or data assimilation, which is all of the uh, data, metadata that can be to the degree you want to professionalize it can be uh, used for various uh, uh, investment reporting, uh, budgeting, uh, cost accounting, uh, the notion of really non-financial performance accounting, uh, financial planning and accounting and fp &A function. So data is becoming a fairly big consideration in family offices. And to do those three things across those three dimensions because of the technology that's available today really does require most of these processes and the information management to be driven by uh, sort of a different enterprise uh, approach to the architecture of data management. And I think that's beginning to really transform family offices from sleepy bookkeeping, Excel-based, um, really, really weak technology uh, entities to some really high-performing uh, firms, particularly this new wealth creator that's from the financial services industry that will power decision-making and planning with better data. That's the new family office that I think is emerging. Yeah, I, 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 when you said Excel, I, I remember back, back in the 80s and you know, working for the family and you know, everything was on Excel and we were so crude and primitive and now technology has definitely provided tremendous amounts of efficiency. I, I wanted to focus on the vertical that you and I talk about the most and that is the investment vertical. It's, it's certainly the area that I think most of us spend most of our time thinking about. And I've argued for a long time that ultra high net worth families definitely have a much expanded toolbox. Um, and it's not just the fact that they have access to private equity and real estate, it's the type of private equity, the type of real estate, the types of sort of things that they do. What are you hearing today from ultra high net worth families as they're looking for opportunities and sourcing those opportunities kind of across the globe? Well, the uh, movement to, uh you know, really accessing uh, direct investing is, you know, we could say it was rumored to be occurring 10 years ago. It is fast afoot. I mean, there's an expectation that I can, uh, given the wealth, excess uh, wealth, um, uh, wealth that I would be willing to expose to illiquidity and presumptively some unit risk. Uh, is available and there's a presumption that the public markets can't produce uh, any extra excess return. I mean, I don't, this is your theory and GBI. I don't want to get into your, your underlying theory, but ex accessing alternatives has proven to be uneven between and among family offices and the ability to uh, generate uh, uh, get staff that will be able to do this, I think has been challenging for a lot of family offices. And these are the drivers of the cost consideration for family offices to be able to get the best staff, to be able to have access to the best alternatives. Uh, and particularly today, I think I'm going to use the class private capital as distinct from real estate and hedge funds to really do something in the private capital uh, ecosystem all up and down the, the system. You, you need to have internal staff or you need to be in uh, the confederation of sourcing communities uh, or perhaps in the vertical that your, your industry vertical that you made your money in, you have access. But it's proven to be uneven and hard for families to get that access. So we're starting to see really formal uh, confederating, co-sourcing, co-diligencing between and among family offices uh, that's really quite uh, fascinating to watch. One of the observations I tell everybody, which is pretty remarkable, is there's not, not, not this monolith out there, but there are these regional family office uh, relationships. And then particularly within industry verticals, whether it be paper and forest products or technology or financial services, there are relationships where people are actually really sharing in information, uh, co-diligencing, co as I said, and, and, and then ultimately co-investing. So I think that's formalizing right now. Um, uh, you know, the disintermediating of the cap intro and placement agent world and going direct is very real right now. Yeah. So, so Jamie, we've we've covered a tremendous amount of information, um, and I know you've been doing this for a really long time. Where can people get additional information? 
Well, I am a founder of something called the Ultra High Net Worth Institute. I would commend uh, the audience to take a look at that. Uh, that is uh, uhnwinstitute.org. That's a think tank, a resource think tank. It's a by invitation organization, but there's some information that one can find there. Uh, my website is full of information, and that's jhmclaughlin.com. And I'd welcome people to call me uh, or contact me direct. Thank you, Jamie. And, and I would just also uh, share that you've been kind enough to share some of your insights in the investments and wealth monitor. We've published things from you in the past, and it's always great to get your insights. So thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for your generosity of your time and your wisdom. And we hope everyone uh, got just a little nugget out of today's discussion. Thank you all. Thanks, Tony. Thank you very much.